Hi, I'm Derek, and when I'm not working on the hook for Joe's mom's next greatest rap album, I'm stacking Benjamins, baby. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and in honor of Women's History Month, which I know all about since Joe's mom has a lot of history, (laughs) you know what I mean, we're going to learn how the first women doctors changed the world of medicine for us all. You've seen the book in the store. Now join me in welcoming the author, Olivia Campbell, to talk about women in white coats. Plus, a year later, what should we have learned from the big stock market crater a year ago? You heard our thoughts on Monday, so we'll chat with financial planner Alex Raffet from Atlanta's East Paces Group for his take today. Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Kevin, who is considering taking on some higher risk, higher reward investments on top of his safer investments. How should he approach this? And I'll please my many, many fans when I share my trivia. And now, two dudes who are about to mansplain Women's History Month, it's Joe and O J J J J G. Well, see, here's the way that it works. Little tongue-in-cheek, people. Yes. Hate have... mail to joe at <laughs> stackingbenjamins.com. I was watching uh, Seth Myers do stand-up, and he said, don't you hate it when guys mansplain stuff to you? See, ladies, what mansplaining is was so good. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. I am Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, socially distanced, thank goodness, because I'm not sure he brushed his teeth, it's Mr. OG. Don't, we, we, uh, we've been told about making those noises. I don't know. Yeah, don't I'm do trying that. to decide. I did have some Cadbury mini eggs for breakfast, so does that oh, count? Oh, yeah, a little sugar to get to started. I have put them in my coffee before, I'll be honest. Does that mean a third of the way through the show, you're going to be blah, 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 and then you'll be asleep? By the time we get to the Haven Lifeline? No, because I've built up my tolerance uh, over, yes. over many years of Cadbury mini eggs. Yeah. It not, takes a whole bag for me to... You're a pro. You're Don't try this at home, kids. I'm not a quitter. I am so excited to talk. You know, I love our shows that are about history. I love our shows that are about professions and the history of medicine when it comes to women. You'll be surprised, OG, how when the first women became doctors it was it wasn't exactly uh well i'm gonna leave it here and i'll save it for later for the interview with olivia but women have not been doctors as long as i thought they have we'll dangle that carrot you'll just have to listen to my interview with olivia campbell later i walked into our local bookstore here just last week and right up front was this book so super excited she's coming on we're also going to revisit how we felt a year ago. Talk to Alex Reffitt from East Paces Group about lessons from the last year after the big down that we talked about on Monday. But first, we got another important headline from late last week, so let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Market Watch. Good news for procrastinators, OG. Great news from the IRS. Lucky, lucky. Yeah, Andrew Keshner. Lucky for you. (laughs) Wrote this. IRS will delay April 15th tax filing deadline by one month, but there's one caveat. IRS has already received, by the way, more than 55 million tax returns. You know why? Uh, Because they told everybody to file early so you could get your stimulus money. Exactly. Nice carrot there, IRS. However, they also said Wednesday of last week that they're pushing the tax filing deadline from April 15th to May 17th continues to be a tough time for many people. The IRS wants to continue to do everything possible to help taxpayers navigate the unusual circumstances related to the pandemic. I was talking to my accountant, uh, Catherine Pomeritz, 
who's been on the show a couple of times. And she was telling me, OG, oh, that some of these COVID related things really are making filing slow and difficult for the people that are doing that every day. Well, what's even more difficult is the fact that while the IRS has received a ton of tax filings already, they're still behind on 2019 tax filings, which were done last year, especially the ones on paper. You know, if you had to file on paper for whatever reason. Somebody does that still? Well, some forms you have to. It's just, you know, the IRS doesn't accept electronic filings for certain things. So, you know, I don't know. It's going to take years for them to unwind all this. There's just so much stuff that everybody's behind on. So now you have till May 17th to get your taxes done and you don't need an extension for that. You can still get an extension to October 15th, but uh, that's only time, of course, to send in a return. It does not give you more time to pay your tax. Your tax now is going to be due on May 17th. There's a couple caveats. Caveat number one, if you're in Texas, Oklahoma, or Louisiana, you were given already a June 15th deadline. So you can mm-hmm. uh, procrastinate even further. And uh, you know what the caveat is, OG? No, uh, no. This does not affect your state taxes. So just, oh, just remember yeah. if you have a state tax return. Who pays state taxes? <laughs> Dummy lives in a state that has state taxes. Last, last time that they did this, last year, in fact, some states also push back their dates. Yeah, they'll do that, obviously. So, uh, But check with your state. You can't tell your state, hey, man, IRS gave us extra time. Might not apply to you. In Texas, we have unlimited time to file our Texas returns. I'm going to sit on mine. Forever. Not doing it, Texas. You yeah. can't make me file that state income tax. I'll show you. This also may be extra time, OG, if you haven't made your, what, your Roth IRA contribution. Mm-hmm. You can sit still put money in, in those types of accounts. You get an extra month to do that. Yeah. It's really good if you've got a few extra, you know, if you're kind of like, oh man, I wish I had a few extra weeks to sort this out because I could come up with the extra cash, you know, one other paycheck or something like that. But just remember also that if you are going to be owing money and you're going to pay it on the 17th, that the quarterly estimate then for 2021, which is do also around that time is going to sneak up on you, you know, that much more quickly because you think about it, you say, okay, well, normally our quarterly estimates are January, April. What's the next month? Do you think everybody gets this wrong? January, April. I'm asking, what do you think it is? You're going to get it wrong. July. It's June. That's the huh? sneaky one. Yeah. And what? then September. So if you end up with a tax due and you're withholding money for next year's taxes, you're, you might be paying two tax bills, three tax bills, kind of kind of in a row. You might be doing paying an estimated payment in April, an estimated payment, an actual payment in May, and then another estimated payment in June. A lot of outflow. So, so kind of think about that from a cash flow standpoint. That's what we, you and I talk a lot about the spending plan as opposed to a budget. In our family, we kind of do quarterly spending plans and and we'll look at it from the beginning of the quarter and say, okay, here's how much money we're starting with in cash reserve, but here are the big things that are coming out. You know, my son has eighth grade graduation this year. So we're going to be spending a lot of money going out to dinner with family because they're all going to be in town. We're headed to the beach for a week, God willing. And, you know, all these different things that are happening in the second quarter for us. If I wasn't planning on making three tax payments, you know, that could be an issue. So just keep that in mind as well. And in our second headline, OG, I was just watching Jim Cramer's reaction to the events of a year ago in a piece from thestreet.com. Then with the market breaks, the biggest drops in history and thinking the worst was just beginning. And of course, spoiler, it, it, it wasn't versus where we are today. And so many people made mistakes back then. We'll link to Kramer's thoughts in our show notes, but I also want to talk to another pro about them versus now and the lessons from a year ago from Atlanta. My dad, shortwave radio. We have Alex Reffitt joining us from East paces group. How are you, man? Doing well, doing well, much better than last March. I know, right. I remember hearing about some pros, Alex, that like sold their client's portfolio, told their clients the worst is coming. It's time to panic. I'm guessing you guys didn't do that. Very much not. No. And it's actually, 
Uh, I'm sad to hear uh, if you've heard that that's happened. One of the most important relationships that a client can have with their advisor is giving perspective and, and helping with some of those behavioral decisions and certainly <laughs> liquidating their portfolio and describing an apocalypse is, is not a good example of that. And it, it always seems like, of course, you know, hindsight here is 2020, but you remember that time a year ago. We have been hearing over and over that the worst was just beginning, right? We were going to fall off the cliff. This was just the first tremor. We got the earthquake coming. Tell me, did you get many calls from your clients? Of course. I mean, naturally, some clients called the, and they were concerned and just about what, what they were seeing on the news. Most clients we proactively reached out to, uh, even just before this happened and as it was beginning and explaining what to expect. Um, you know, we can't, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't always predict things, but, but our team here at these spaces group has lived through many of these before the tech bubbles, the 08, 09 crisis. So there is some precedent for what kind of behaviors during those times work and which ones don't. We're hearing some of those same things today. You know, the market now screaming up again. How do we prep ourselves for this the next time, Alex? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, uh, if you didn't do the right thing, you learned your lesson. But the reality is you just need to have figure out what you're trying to accomplish with your investments. If you're trying to time the market, then be prepared to try and time the market. I don't think that that's the right strategy for most anybody or really anybody at all, no matter how smart they are, because you've got to make two decisions. You've got to not only sell at the right time, but buy at the right time. And there were plenty of people that sold early on into the, the coronavirus crash in, in March, some of them never bought back in. So net net, they they're actually put themselves to detriment by if they would have just done nothing. So, you know, make sure you really understand what your plans are, have a strategy. For most people, if you're invested the way you should be invested, based off your age and what you're trying to accomplish with your investments over a 10, 15, 20 year period, you'll make it through those. <laughs> I mean the the real uh, the real challenge is making sure you have the liquidity that you need. So just understand how long do you think a recession can last? You know, what's the what's your worst case scenario of what you might face in a pandemic or, or some other type of black swan crisis? And then figure out how much you need to have to get through that, <laughs> how much money you need to get through that. If you think it's five years, is that $200,000? Is that a million dollars? And then make sure you've got that amount of money invested in a way that's not going to participate or at least participate much in a serious recession. That's the best way to feel good about surviving one of these is just knowing what are you trying to accomplish and then having a plan that represents that. Thinking that you can just get out of the market altogether before these things happen or right after they happen and then get back in at a very opportune time just hasn't been a proven successful strategy by hardly anyone. I love you saying that because we often get pushback from listeners and uh, you may sometimes from clients too, Alex, about the importance of emergency fund, you know, because people tell you that interest rates are really low, as you know, right now. So why the hell would I put money in cash? But really, it sounds like what you're saying is that cash, it's not about that interest rate. It's about a buffer. Sure. It can be a buffer. You know, if you're trying to have a conservative element to your portfolio to feel comfortable being aggressive with the other parts, it can kind of be that self-insurance policy. Um, it could also be if you are a market timer and you think that you can do that consistently well over time, cash can be an asset class from just liquidity buying power. If you do see a serious market correction, that cash can be an opportunistic bet just as much as anything else. So it's just a, it doesn't just have to be something you invest in a very low yielding instrument uh, for no purpose whatsoever. I'd have a very specific purpose for your cash or your cash alternatives. So like, did you think of it then like a bucket system? For some people, absolutely. That's why when we're saying cash, you know, and cash alternatives, they can be in things that are not necessarily paying you know, half a percentage point, but things that are investments, things that have opportunities, things that yield better, yeah. but are still don't have a strong beta to the market, you know, aren't going to participate as severely within market drawdowns. Gotcha. That's so interesting. If people want to know more, I believe the website is eastpacesgroup.com to reach you. That's right. Yep. And uh, or just call us. We're happy to happy to help if we can. Well, I'd rather have them call you than pull their hair out, my friend. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, for spend, <laughs> thanks for spending a couple of minutes with us, Alex, and talking about a year ago. It's 
always sad to go back there, but I think we've learned some great lessons. It's important to learn from history. It's not necessarily going to repeat itself on a global level, but it can, can on a personal level if you're not careful. So I um, hope it was helpful to somebody, and thanks for having me. Big thanks to Alex for stopping by. I still can't believe it's been a year, OG. Still can't believe it's been a year since I've done it. flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> or something, right? Having fun or figuring out where I'm going to live next month, one of the two. Well, that was for you. Yeah. In just a second, OG and I will have our takeaways from today's show. But first, raised in a trailer park with no clear path to success, kicked out of high school multiple times, and faced with becoming a father in his teens, Jason Waller is the definition of a true underdog. After hearing the words no or you can't too many times, he unleashed the power within to start three successful companies and his most recent venture, Power Home Solar, been skyrocketing on a path to become a billion dollar enterprise. So join us as Waller, a four-time Entrepreneur of the Year winner, shares motivational tips, inspiring stories, and business building lessons from the ground up. He shares his life experiences and that of his high-profile guest to help others better themselves. And as Waller will tell you, there isn't an elevator to success. That climb only happens one step at a time. Let every true underdog podcast be that step that elevates you. Scared money won't make money. Learn about failure. Learn about entrepreneurship. Learn about never quitting or making excuses. It's real. It's raw. It's motivational. Check out True Underdog Podcast at trueunderdog.com or wherever you get your podcast. So I think our takeaways are that if you don't owe money, getting an extra month for you to put some more money in. But if you owe OG might mean a little strategy cash flow wise for you and your business to get your act together. But then I think our second takeaway is the stock market, play the long game. Well, Olivia Campbell has one of the hottest books out right now, Women in White Coats. Olivia Campbell's a journalist. She's an author specializing in women and medicine. Her works appeared in The Guardian, The Washington Post, New York Magazine, The Cut, among others. This is her first nonfiction book, Women in White Coats, and man, is it a big one. I have seen this book right up front when we walk into our local bookstore, probably in your local bookstore right up front as well. So we're super excited to have her celebrating Women's History Month, but also to talk about careers, evolution of medicine, and uh, there's so many financial topics woven into these stories. If you're somebody that like, did you see the movie Hidden Figures? I did. We watched it back. It's actually been on a lot lately, unlike TBS and stuff. So it's kind of playing nonstop in our house right now. Yeah, if you liked Hidden Figures, I think you're going to like this because she talks about three women who were the first three doctors and all that they had to go through, which as you can believe, just a little bit. So let's say hello to her, Olivia Campbell, coming down to the basement. And coming down the stairs to sit across the basement from me, social distancing still going on. Olivia Campbell's here. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm glad you could join us to talk about this because with uh, Cheryl, my spouse, being in healthcare and just none of this book, Olivia, and, I, and I'm wondering if you got this response from most people, none of this book went the way I thought it would. Like, don't get me wrong. I thought that women have definitely had a hell of a time getting into medicine, but just some of the stories at the beginning of the book, just just absolutely harrowing. It was as infuriating as it was inspiring to read. You know, there are points in the book where you will, you know, do a spit take, you'll spit out your water because you're so, you cannot believe what these women are going through that, you know, men from the obstetrical society are like, no, we, we're not going to examine you. When you think, what in the world is their problem? Like, come on, come on, people. Well, and I know that this is an area that you've been attached to a lot. You've written a lot about women in medicine. 
But where was your entry into this? I'm very curious about how you first got interested in women in medicine. And then second, how did, how did the research for this book start? Where did the genesis of the idea for this work begin? The first thing I read about in this topic specifically was uh, two riots that happened in the Victorian era. So there was one riot in Philadelphia uh, near where I live. And then there was another riot about a year later in Edinburgh, Scotland. And both were like identical riots. So I was like, there's something going on here. So there were both cases where men were throwing violent, nasty fits temper tantrums when women appeared alongside them in the classroom at medical school. Just a few women come in to take a class, to take an exam. And the men have been prepared that, you know, in Philadelphia, there was like, they gathered together like 300 students to throw a, a riot at these women trying to attend a lecture. I was like, these, these are too similar. You know, there's, there's really, there's something here. What, what, what else going on here? So I wanted to dig in further and see just to the extent of the sexism, the harassment these women were facing in the Victorian era, just to try to go to medical school, just to try to learn how to be a doctor, just like men. Wow. And I bet that rabbit hole opened up in a hurry. I can imagine. Yeah, it was kind of endless. Uh, my, my first idea for this book was much broader. It, it included more people, uh, women at the school in Philadelphia, which didn't make the final cut. But yes, there's a lot, a lot more stories, stories of women in New York, stories of women in Philadelphia that I would love to have included. Unfortunately, there was a lot to mine. I was going to say, maybe that's the sequel, huh? Maybe yeah, right. get, the, get, the, get the part two. But I love that we were able to go into depth on on three, these three women, Elizabeth Blackwell, Elizabeth Garrett, and Sophia Jex uh, Blake. Uh, I believe that's how you say her name, Jex Blake? Yes. Yes. Uh, before we get to them, though, explain for me something. You know, you talk about the Victorian era. You're talking about 1840s and 1850s. I was surprised, Olivia, to find out from you that there were no women doctors before then. Were you surprised that there were no women in medicine as doctors before then? Yeah, I, it was really shocking to me that well, it's really hard for us to think today to the idea of walking into a hospital, walking into a doctor's office, and there's literally no women there ready to treat you, right? That We can't even fathom that. There were women practicing in like these side fields, right? The women were not allowed into the, the strict medical medicine, right? They they were allowed to practice to be herbalist or something, you know, like the size people. I don't want to say there were absolutely no women at all delivering medical care because we do have some nurses and things like that. But yes, no women were allowed to get the license, to get the degree that allowed them to legally licensedly practice medicine. Reading all about the medieval era and how the church established universities basically branded all the women healers as witches. And well, that's, what them. Gonna, that's what I was actually going to ask you about Olivia was that there had to have been some women over time that presented themselves as doctors, right? From time to time, some woman must have said, Hey, I'm a doctor. Absolutely. Women have been medical caregivers have been physicians since the dawn of civilization, healer priestesses in ancient Egypt, you know, through Greece, through uh, in Africa and Asia, the Ottoman Empire, uh, all these places, women have played a key role in healthcare and in caregiving. But it's in this medieval era, late medieval era, that when the church decides, okay, we're going to control medicine, we're going to say, you have to have a degree, you have to have a license, which in some ways is good because you want to have some sort of, you know, as a patient, you want proof that your doctor has gone through some sort of something to know what they're talking about, right? So this is good. We're trying to save people from quacks, from, you know, snake oil salesmen, this kind of thing. But at, at the same time, when you make it only for men, that's where you have a problem, right? You're saying these wise women, these healers that have been working as herbalists in her community for years and years, they pass down knowledge from her mother to her daughter, they really know what they're talking about. And then just for them to say, oh, no, you can't practice anymore. We're going to say you're a witch. We're going to kill you. That's where the problem started for women, for sure. And they did burn them. I don't remember the number. It was a huge number that you have in the book, the number of women who were killed uh, because they were witches. It was in the hundreds of thousands. Yes. Yeah, that was Wow. So let's go to the mid 1800s then. And Elizabeth Blackwell, she seems to me, Olivia, like an unlikely candidate. Let's put it that way to be the first <laughs> woman doctor. And uh, if you agree, well, whether you agree or not, tell us a little bit about Elizabeth Blackwell and why she might not have been the perfect person to be the first woman doctor. 
Well, she's always struck me as sort of an odd duck. She's very eccentric. Um, she's a little weird. And she's not really super into women's rights issues broadly. So for her to be this, you know, main pioneer in women becoming doctors was, yes, it is very odd to me, for sure. Well, she, um, she also, not to interrupt, but she's also not into medicine at all. Right. No, she thinks it's gross. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to be a doctor. That's gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, she's like, well, the first thing I got to do is get over this idea that medicine is absolutely disgusting. So I better do that quick. Right. <laughs> so, right. It's her dying neighbor that encourages her to say, my pain would have been alleviated so much better if I'd had a woman doctor. Why? You're so smart, Elizabeth. You should go into medicine. And she's like, oh, no, I don't know about that. But this, you know, this little idea takes seed in her brain and it starts growing. And finally, she's like, OK, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do this. But first, she needs money. Right. Because it, it, her family, it, she's been supporting her family by teaching. They have a little boarding house at their home. They're, they're not a rich family. So she's got to go to all these different schools around the country and, and teach wherever she can find a post to earn enough money to go to medical school, first of all. And then she once she starts applying, you know, everybody turns her down. She's sending her application out to dozens of medical schools and they're all like, no, you're not coming only because you're a woman, not any other reason. I want to ask you questions about all those things. Let's talk about her dying neighbor first, because through her dying neighbor, you give us kind of a look into the quality of care that she would have gotten at the time, like the state of medicine at that time. Walk us through some of the, you know, you talked about quacks earlier, Olivia. There's still a lot of quackery going on in the mid 1800s. Oh, for sure. You have the mesmerism people using their magic energies to, to heal people that, you know, your electrical field is healing you. Uh, yeah, those kind of people. And also because Traditional medicine is becoming more of a scientific practice at this era. This is kind of, you know, this where it's turning the corner um, and becoming what it is today. Doctors are spending less and less time with their patients. And that's something that sends people over to the alternative practitioners is that, oh, well, they listen to my problems. They spend time with me, oh. you know, because that's how they make the money. Right. Sure. But for women, especially, it was. First of all, there was a stigma of having a diagnosis because you might not be able to find a good husband if you were branded with an illness. You might be shunned from society. And also women didn't want to talk to the male doctors about their problems, about the more delicate gynecological issues they were having. Her neighbor was dying of ovarian cancer is what historians believe. So she didn't go to the doctor right away. Uh, you know, those symptoms are hard to detect at first, but also they're a lot easier to treat the earlier you catch it. So if these women are putting off treatment because they don't want to talk to a doctor, a male doctor, then that's where the problems start. And that's where they start dying a lot sooner or, you know, not being able to be treated. I can just imagine the shame and the stigma and, you know, all this extracurricular stuff instead of just getting some help. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth decides to go to college Let's talk about medical school then. What did medical schools look like at that time and about how much money did she need to save, Olivia? Well, she needed to save about $3,000. This was just on the hope that she would get into medical school. She was working as hard as she could as a teacher and she tried to find teaching jobs where there were medical men, you know, were teachers or were you know, administrators at a school so she could kind of mine their libraries and start her training early. But yeah, she had to work for many, many years just hoping that eventually when she was made enough money that finally she would get admitted to a medical school. Well, and you said that she was denied, but she wasn't just denied, Olivia. Tell me a little bit about those about those denials, because they were oh. like uh, no uncertain terms. Hell no. They were nasty. They were like, absolutely not. What are you thinking? What? How dare you? Basically, you know, what was the one with the guy who was like, we're not going to furnish you with a stick to bash our heads with or oh. something was his response. Like, we're not going to give you the tools you need to take over our profession. She has a family friend she goes to. I believe his name is Joseph Warrington. He's a Quaker and kind of liberal. So she thinks that he's going to be helpful. He wasn't. It seems like Olivia. Well, tell me, family, friends family? How did they take her wanting to become a doctor? They were as upset as other women. Like, I think she had a slightly easier time, honestly. As far as Warrington, like the friends, society, they definitely want her. He was like, oh, let me be a nurse instead. Women are supposed to be a, a man's helper, 
not the boss. We don't want to set you up to fail, basically what he told her. So we're going to let's just have you train to be a nurse. That, that'll that be OK. And yes, this is like one of the most liberal people she can find. He, this is a man who set up training programs for midwives and for nurses in Philadelphia. So she's like, oh, this will be it. And eventually she kind of turns him around and is like, OK, yes, you're right. He also tells her that that she should go to Paris, right, to, and dress as a man to, to earn a degree there. So. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it does seem like like a well-meaning friend when you're talking to them about creating your new business and they don't want to see you fail. So they give you all these. <laughs> no, maybe you should lower your expectations. Yes, exactly. It's really it's a show of her ability to be like, that's nice that you said that, but we're going to keep trying this path. It's the path of hell. What was it? Yeah, yes. If my path led me into hell, then I, I would go there. And, you know, I still wouldn't dress as a man. But he was like, you know, you, you can't be a woman by yourself in Paris if you go. And it is funny how this woman that wanted nothing to do with medicine all of a sudden says, hey, if the path goes through hell, I am going. Like now she's, it's going to happen. Yeah. She seemed to me more interested in being the first, being a pioneer, not necessarily a celebrity, but like she wanted social change. She wanted women to have these opportunities. So she didn't really care whether it was medicine or some other profession. It just kind of was like medicine happened to be what she chose, honestly. Did Elizabeth Garrett or Sophia Jex Black, the two other women that you profile in the book, did they, did they get more help at home or did they also have a heck of a time with their family? Well, Elizabeth Garrett, she had a rich family, uh, so eventually they came around. But at first, yeah, her mother flew into a depressive episode and wouldn't come out of her room for weeks and was like, oh, my gosh, why? Why don't you want to just stay home and be a wife and take care of, you know, your brothers and sisters? And then uh, so eventually she talked them around like her father eventually became a very strong supporter of her. And they were always a financial support. She needed she needed her father's support. Right. Because she wasn't going to be able to pay for all this private classes that she had to take on her own. So Sophia was also from a rich family. She she basically threw a little fit to get her way. Um, she was very good at controlling the men in her life to uh, and, you know open their purse strings when it suited her. You know, women use these hysterics to their advantage, right? Right. <laughs> but there are stories of women who, um, there's a famous, I think it was a woman in either in Philadelphia or New York, but her mother said, I'd rather see my daughter at an insane asylum than at medical school. It was and, just uh, incredible. <laughs> One of Elizabeth Blackwell's protégés, Marie, uh, when she wrote to her father to tell her, oh, I, I've got just earned my M.D., I know she's like one of like the fourth or fifth woman in the, in America to do this. And her father was like, well, if you were my son, I'd be so proud of you, but you're my daughter. So all I can do is beep. So that, that to me, like perfectly encapsulates what we're dealing with here. It's like, yeah, if you're a guy, this is great. If you're a woman, oh my gosh, what are you thinking? Absolutely not. So she finally becomes the doctor though. Which college accepted Elizabeth Blackwell? So she, yes, she applies to dozens of places and they say, no, 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 absolutely not. What are you thinking? She finally gets into Geneva College in New York as a joke. The administrators there didn't want to be the ones to say no to a woman student, right? So they decide they're going to put it to the student body to decide whether she gets in or not. And so they go to the students and like, hey, we've got this application from a woman. Do you think we should accept her or not? And they're like, oh, this has to be a joke from a neighboring college, you know, pull, they're pulling our leg. This isn't real. So they're like, oh, yeah, sure, she can come. And they're, then a few weeks later, there's a real woman appears in the classroom and they're like, oh, man, <laughs> what did we do? Big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> and so she finishes college. And, and, and I think when we're ending this part of the book, Olivia, I feel like this is a triumph and she's a trailblazer. But then you you drop the other shoe and tell us that's not the case at all, that uh, she it really it was still very hard for women after her. Yeah, it's she had a much easier time in college itself. Um, almost all the women that came after her that tried to go to a co-ed school or that tried to you know apply even to schools were had a terrible time with harassment, with the riots and things like that. So she had a relatively easy time once she got into school. And but then when she graduated, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, that's done. We, you know, we're going to have a happy story after this. Well, no, absolutely not. It got, went downhill straight from there. You know, she couldn't find a job anywhere. No one was going to employ her. And then so she finally sets up her own 
medical practice and no one's coming. She's running out of money. She is cold. She just has to ration her food, ration her coal. She's like super down on her luck and it's pretty dire, you know? And then all the women that came after who are trying to get into schools, her sister too, her sister, Emily is trying to get into school. She gets kicked out of one school because they're like, Oh no, you can't be here anymore. We're just, we changed our mind. You're a woman go away. So it doesn't open the door. It basically shuts it even harder because they're like, oh, no, we can't have this happen again. We can't have another woman get a medical degree. Even, yeah, the note from the, um, was it the president of uh, Geneva College saying that this was not a, this was an experiment, I think you you wrote. Yes. <laughs> this is yes. an experiment. An experiment. Not a, yeah. Not a precedent. Yes. We're not going to repeat this. This didn't work out. We didn't like how this went. We got way too much negative attention from the medical establishment. We're going to close our doors to any further women. So, yeah, it was not good. This is the whole reason why these women had to open their own women's medical schools, because the, the more you push, the more pushback you get. We talk a lot on the show, Olivia, about the importance of a strong network. And as you're leaving uh, the story of Elizabeth Blackwell and and moving into Elizabeth Garrett, you have Elizabeth Garrett reading in a in a magazine or a publication about Elizabeth Blackwell. And that kind of spurred her along to also want to become a physician, which was pretty exciting. How often was a network of women important to these women's careers and continuing to push forward? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I call it the scientific sisterhood, as dorky as that sounds. But (laughs) yeah, without other women, you know, it would have been so lonely. And Elizabeth talks about that. You know, she's been in New York trying to have a practice for so many years and it's so, you know, it's bleak, it's winter and she's just super depressed. And then her friend Ann Preston from the Women's College in Philadelphia comes and gives her a visit and she's full of this optimistic energy and excitement about women studying medicine. And that really, you know, turns her mood around and really, you know, reignites her passion for what she's doing. So yes, these these other women to support them and remind them why it is they're doing what they're doing essential. Yeah, finding those people, even when it's your family, is sometimes, well, most <laughs> often not in your corner. Is there anything that really surprised you as you were researching where you went, wow, that's something totally different than I thought? Well, first of all, I was very shocked by how little education you needed to, to have an MD at this era. Like Elizabeth Blackwell, the year she's accepted into Geneva, the year she starts is the year the American Medical Association is born. And this is when... They say like, oh, well, a medical degree shouldn't just be like a few months. Let's make it a couple of years, right? Let's extend it just a little bit. So you're really, it's essentially barely an undergraduate degree at this point. I mean, you do a few years of training and then you do like an internship somewhere and then you do a dissertation and some exams and that's, then you're like, okay, you're a doctor now. So they're, they're turning out men who've never seen a real childbirth to go out in the world. All right, you're a doctor now, go deliver some babies. These poor women, they're approaching in labor. <laughs> Only ever seen it in books, right? One of the other main things that I really loved was how many of these women were queer Sophia has a girlfriend. Emily Blackwell has a girlfriend. Marie has a girlfriend. Elizabeth Garrett's daughter has a girlfriend. Like, And they, they were also very religious. So they're very Christian, very conservative, but they're also lesbians. And they're, that's okay to be both at that time. And I love that. Do you think that the ability to know that you're different and to be okay with standing out to some degree I mean, even with some people in today's society, you know how hard it is for people to come out. Do you think that that was part of what pushed them along? Absolutely. I I definitely think that were some of these women not queer, that they would not have pushed in the way they did. They, you know, society wanted women to be housewives. They wanted women to be baby factories, right? They, that was your job. And if that's not your path, if you're not planning on getting married, if you're not planning on having kids, then you have to find another way. And you have to support yourself. You can't rely on your husband's job. You have to say, you know what? Women deserve to have well-paid jobs too, not just men. So, uh, you know, you have you take a house with another woman. You take a house with lots of other women to say, okay, we're going to have a, a group of ladies that live in a house and we're all supporting each other. And financially, we're, we're independent. We're supporting ourselves. And if they hadn't already been different like that, then I don't think that a lot of places they would have pushed in the way they did. 
And also for Sophia, she, I think it really helps that she wasn't ever trying to impress men. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't looking for a male companion at all. Whereas Elizabeth Garrett, she was very always concerned about being too flirty, wondering what the men were thinking about her that she worked with. Sophia didn't care. She wasn't interested in them romantically. She said whatever she wanted and she just kept pushing for what she wanted and didn't care what the men thought of her. And I love that about her. I could just imagine her with uh, an eye roll as they're teaching her about <laughs> about leeches or bloodletting or or <laughs> what was that little metal ball, the toxic metal ball that they had people, the pill oh, they had God. people swallow so they'd throw up and then it would come out and they'd use it again. <laughs> The everlasting pill. <laughs> oh, yes. Medicine really was super gross at the time. And, you know, so it really is impressive that these women <laughs> could handle it, honestly. But yeah, they, that was the, the everlasting pill. That it was, it made you have terrible diarrhea or it made you, you know, vomit oh, back up. And oh. that, the, the, that cleansed you, apparently. That was the cleansing process of this toxic metal. And then you'd rinse it off after you retrieved it and you put it back in the cabinet for the next family member that was sick and use it again. <laughs> Hashtag science, Olivia. Hashtag science. <laughs> yeah. The book is called Women in White Coats, How the First Women Doctors Changed the World of Medicine. I'm sure it's available everywhere. Uh, yep. Your local independent bookstore, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, online at Target. If you want a signed copy, my local bookshop, Newtown Bookshop in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Oh, has cool. Online. You can order online signed copies from them. We will link to your local independent bookstore then in our show notes Excellent. page. Yeah, at stackybenjamins.com. Olivia, thanks for hanging out and talking women's history, talking science, talking uh, trailblazers with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. Hey, stackers, it's your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I've been asking Olivia Campbell for medical advice all morning, but she just keeps saying she's a historian, not a doctor. I've heard it before, Olivia. If you don't want to check the rash, just say so. I can take it. Anyway, remember the open of the show where I mentioned that Joe's mom has a lot of history? Yeah, uh, she was standing over by the canned peaches when I said that and she heard every last word so <laughs> I'm telling you that woman's stealthy like a cat but you're still down here no, it's a compliment I swear it's like a cat you know they're really elegant and ah. before I dig myself any deeper let's get to today's trivia with our discussion of doctors today, it's appropriate that today just so happens to be world tuberculosis day Tuberculosis is close to eradicated in the U.S., so the question is, what is the most deadly disease in the country today? I'll be back faster than you can schedule your next doctor's visit. And not with Olivia. One star, Olivia. One star on Yelp. That's what I'm giving you. Difficult to schedule. You've seen Rich Eisen on TV and heard him on the radio, but have you listened to the Rich Eisen Show podcast? You mentioned Harry Connick Jr. If I'm not mistaken, Harry Connick Sr. defeated the real Jim Garrison in real life in the city of New Orleans. The guy who was prosecuting the case in JFK. Did I just do a whole six degrees with Harry Connick Jr. with you, Kevin Bacon? Yeah, that was super impressive. <laughs> Why, thank you. The Rich Eisen Show podcast. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. It's your penitent pal, neighbor Doug. Who would have thought that Joe's mom would have been so hurt by me saying she has a lot of history earlier? I mean, can I take it back? God, she sure can't dish it, but damn well can't take it. Let's be honest, though. I mean, she really does have a lot of history. Like, I mean, Ben Franklin's got nothing on her. Know what I'm saying? So, if any of you have any ideas on how I can smooth over this little crisis that I just created, just uh, email joe at stackingbenjamins.com and he'll pass it on to me. I don't really know how to do the email thing. I could have my own email, but then the paparazzi get it and, uh, you know, I'd be like overwhelmed with fan mail and it's just, I don't need that. No, who needs that? Oh God, here she comes. Here she comes. 
On that note, let's get back to today's trivia. The question was, what is the most deadly disease in the U.S. today? According to the CDC, coming in at number three are cerebrovascular diseases, mostly stroke. Uh, at number two, chronic lower respiratory illness. And at number one, it's heart disease. Fortunately, there are lots of things you can do, like eating healthy and watching your weight and not pissing off Joe's mom and exercising are all things that can keep you free of heart disease. And while I may not be a historian, oink, wink, I do know a thing or two about health. I'm all caught up on Grey's Anatomy. Hey, uh, may maybe Meredith Grey will check out this rash for me when she comes out of her coma. See ya. Nailed it. Heart disease. COVID. I can't believe 1840s, 1850s just seems like yesterday. Maybe not like yesterday, but maybe. <laughs> 1840s does not seem like yesterday. But that seems awfully late to have your first women as doctors, doesn't it? Well, I mean, there was that whole period of time where some of them were witches. We had to be careful. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. She, well, she talked about that. Yeah. About, yeah, hey, was, we can't, we can't be. Yes. Yes. Never be too sure. It needs to come from men. If it's a mm -hmm. woman, it's the dark art. Yes. Exactly. So you had, to, you had to kind of flush that out of the psyche. Took a couple of generations, a couple hundred generations. A couple, a couple thousand generations. Yeah. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency put what you value first. You know, right now, big fan of uh, big fan of Easter candy. It's hard to hard to keep my fingers off of it. Trying to watch this this figure. Have you already started telling the kids that there's going to be no Easter candy? Uh, no, because we just. My wife goes by. She's like, I bought this Easter candy for the kids, and I'm like, okay. And then like it'll just it'll you know, it's like a little open. You know, you just slide one of the little candies out one at a time. And then she's like, what happened to Easter candy? I'm like, I don't know. Those kids are terrible. It's but we should horrible. get more just just to be just to be safe. Easter candy goes great with uh reading Olivia's book. And that's why they make buying term life insurance so simple. So you've got more time to look at the important things in life. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. No waiting several weeks for a decision. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. What you'll find is that their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. No waiting several weeks. And of course, they're backed by a 160 year old insurer, Mass Mutual. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And today we're going to throw out Haven Lifeline to our friend Kevin. Say hi, Kevin. Hi, I'm calling for my favorite celebrity couple, Joe G. I've got a question that I was hoping you might be able to answer for those of us who have, as Doug might like to say, an age deficit. I've read Phil Towns' books and listened to his podcast as well, and was directed to a book called The Dono Investor, written by Manesh Pabrai. In the book, Pabrai lays out the concept of heads I win, tails I don't lose too much. As a young investor, should we follow this riskier path of putting relatively small amounts of money compared to the absolute stacks that we'll be able to save later in life into potentially higher yielding investments? Or should we follow the general guidelines of the investing community and dump it all into a fund like BTSAX and let compounding work its magic over the course of 40 or 50 years? Or is there some blend of the two that's best? Maybe all the 401k and Roth IRA money goes into VTSAX. Whatever else we manage to save is our heads I win, tails I don't lose too much money. I know the term risky is somewhat vague, but know that when I say risky, I don't mean trading GameStop options on a margin, but perhaps something more like picking individual stocks for medium to long-term holding in a similar vein to how Phil Town invests. Or maybe I'll just buy a nice mic and start my own podcast for all that big podcast money you're always talking about. Thanks. <laughs> Get in on it, man. The water's warm. The water is warm. Tons of money in podcasting land. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Probably not. Thanks for the question, Kevin. You know, it's interesting when you talk about that particular book. I was listening to Tim Ferriss talk to Nick Kakonis, and Nick Kakonis was uh, referencing this same book, OG. 
and talking about uh, about this uh, investment philosophy. Yeah, I haven't heard it, but um, this is why you have to think about the asset classes and their expected returns over a long period of time and where you're supposed to put the money. And if you think about expected returns and you think about historical returns and the different types of places that you can park your cash, you get to the point where you start deleting things. You start deleting asset classes from the mix. You say, well, fixed income is never going to get me there because over a hundred years, a T-bills turn from a dollar to 21 bucks. That doesn't do much for me in the long run. It provides stability if I've got a goal that's coming up in the next two or three or four years and I need the money for absolutely positively. But in the context of long-term investment planning or long-term investing, it provides no value. So you start eliminating things and then you're left with international big companies and international small companies and emerging market companies, big and small, and U.S. companies, big and small. And so there's a yeah, I think there is a right combination to that. If you wanted to swing for the fences, you could say, well, I'll just put all my money in emerging market small company value stocks and be done with it, or U.S. small company value. But the problem isn't the expected return then. The problem then becomes when it goes down by half or two thirds, which it will do, are you not only going to stay the course, but also be able to double down? And everybody claims that they have a strong stomach for this stuff because they use their past experiences. As an example, I say, well, March of last year and the market went down, I stayed the course. And I go, well, yeah, but that was 34%. That wasn't 66%, number one. And you had 100 grand. You didn't have a million or 2 million or 5 million. It's not about trying to have the best return possible, trying to have the best return that you're not going to bail from when the opposite thing happens. And I think that becomes more and more difficult the further you get down the path and the more money you have at stake and the closer you are to your goal. It's I mean, funny. imagine the person... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, it's funny you say that because that was kind of my thought, and it, which is why I was glad to hear you say that, that I think that if you're going to go the Phil Town route, you need to do it early because it's all about, as you said, it's, I think it's more about you and your emotions and also knowing your systems, right? Knowing what your system is to investing and getting the system down so that you don't wreck it. Like people wreck their diet or they wreck their workout plan just by not, it's the same with your investing philosophy. Well, I just like to play a little devil's advocate here. If you think about it purely from an investment return perspective, and this is what I say when, you know, on Monday, we talked about paying the house off early versus investing it. If we were truly going to quote unquote, optimize everything. You know what you should do? You should margin everything to the extent that the company will let you, that you have your money at, double down, borrow every dollar you possibly can on your line of credit through your house, always keep your house at 80 or 90% full up on, on debt and invest the difference. In fact, I, I got to find this study because I'm, I heard it anecdotally. Apparently, there's something going around from Yale where they tracked all these different scenarios of people who, if you have 100000 in your investment account and you have your money at Fidelity, Fidelity will let you buy another 100000 worth of stock, right? It's called margin. And it's super risky. When it works, it works really great. And when it doesn't work, it exponentially goes bad in a hurry because of the, the way that that works. But it would be in your best interest to not only margin everything, but then if it blew up, to do it again. And the thing with leverage or the thing with high returning allocations, potentially high returning allocations, is that it works only in limited periods of time. And so you have to be okay with all the rest of the time not winning and still do it. You know, So you take small company value, for example, which is the highest return in the US, and from 2011 through 2016, didn't do anything. You got your butt whooped to tech companies. And then from November of 2016 through December 24th of 2016, it went up double. And then it did nothing again until this past election, you know, in November. Actually, it started in September this time. And since September, small caps are up some 50, 70%, give or take, and tech stocks are up four or five. And that whole time, that whole time, by the way, you're going to hear these headlines that you're wrong the whole time you're sitting yeah. there on your philosophy 
knowing your stuff or not knowing your stuff, believing that it's going to work, you're going to have people in your ear all the time telling you that you missed the train. For years and years and years and years and years on end. And then it pays off and then it stops paying off. And you have to still do the same thing for years and years and years. So the hard part isn't picking the stock. It's not picking Apple or Tesla or small caps or, or emerging market or whatever. The hard part is, are you going to be able to stick it out and stick it out when it doesn't go your way? And it doesn't go your way could look like I started with a hundred grand and now I have 40. It could also look like I started with a hundred grand and it's been three years and I still have a hundred grand and all my buddies have 300 grand. And maybe, I'll, you know what? Maybe there's something to this GameStop thing. You know, I could probably throw a few dollars at it and then you do good and you which make is, a few bucks. Which, which by the way is horrible. Yeah. So, so you, yeah, you peel off 10 grand, whatever. And like that 10 turns into 60 and you go, wait a second, 10, 60. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, if I did with that a hundred, oh gosh. And then you do it again and maybe make a few more bucks and then you go belly up because something goes against you. The hard part isn't picking the stuff. It's, it's sticking with it. Like that margin discussion. So you have a hundred thousand in your investment account and you buy $200,000 worth of stock and it goes belly up. You know what you have to do? You have to do it again. You have to go do the exact same thing again. Like get out your margin, go to a different broker, start it up, double down, and do it again. You have to keep doing it because eventually it pays off. My point is, is I don't think that that works in real life. The road to financial independence is paved with plenty of people who are trying to find the next best thing. All stocks? Yes. All ETFs and mutual funds? Absolutely. You want to pick stocks instead of mutual funds and ETFs? Don't care. I, that, I don't really care. Do you want to put some money in fixed income? Whatever. doesn't hurt my feelings. you know. But do you think like you can just go out and buy the next five best returning stocks and you can do it all on long-term options and Reddit your way to success? I doubt it. Not successfully long-term anyway. The reason that I like uh, finding what's called the efficient frontier, which is historically the using modern portfolio theory, looking at the asset classes that got you there, like what diversified approach got you there. The reason I like using that OG is a lot, I realized, baked into what you just said, which is that, well, you know, he used shorthand VTSAX. And if you don't know what that is, that's buying the total U.S. stock market, just buying, frankly, some of everything. And you get a little piece of international, right? Because some of those companies are international. You'll get some small, you get some middle, you get some big. So you, you're just buying a little bit of everything. And it's, it's kind of like um, uh, playing darts in whoever's, yeah, close enough. You know, I'm, I'm sure I didn't hit the bullseye with that, but I'm in the general area and I don't have to worry about it. That's a decent place to start. But, oh, gee, that's not, it isn't a philosophy. And when that goes poorly like everything will go poorly. I don't think you really understand why you're there. And I think that especially people that listen to financial podcast, right? We, we build spreadsheets for everything. We build spreadsheets for our budget. We take a look at the future of what we're going to, you know, how are we going to reach our number, get to our goal? We will have spreadsheets for everything. And then it comes to investing and we say, no, I'm just going to buy one fund. And that's not to say buying one fund's bad, you just still don't have a philosophy or your quote spreadsheet. If you know what I'm talking about, you don't have your system. And so at the very least going out and finding the efficient frontier and having a four fund system, and you know that you're going to rebalance twice a year. Sustainable system wins, man. Yeah. And I think it soothes the thing that also bothers us which is we are, we are creatures that have a bias toward action. And when we don't act right, we've got words for that. We call that lazy, call it procrastinating. Well, you know, better than 99% of people, OG, that usually action doesn't make sense. But if I've got a four fund approach versus a one fund approach, I can keep my bias toward action through rebalancing, have a system that I understand why it works, rebalancing the efficient frontier. And we won't go into the whole efficient frontier thing today. It, it isn't hard. I think the name, the efficient frontier makes it sound like it's this super hard thing and it's not, but that is, I think the other side of, of what you're saying 
is the reason why I have a problem with people stopping at the total market index. Well, you just have to know yourself. The reality is, is that if you get anywhere north of three and a half percent a year, you're doing better than the average investor. The bar is not high. Not that you're trying to compare yourself to the average investor, but all the studies show that the average person returns less than three and a half percent a year, period. You go, that's not possible. The average investment gets 10% a year. Yeah, I know. It's because people buy it and sell it at the wrong times. Because just to your point, people want to do stuff. Just doing nothing is very impossible to do. So anything better than that is better than that, right? I mean, if, if you want to put it all in U.S. small company value and you can grit a, get out a stack of Bibles and say, I'll never move it for the rest of my life, for the rest of my kids' lives, for the rest of my grandkids' lives, then yes, you will be wildly successful and you'll blow the doors off. You and I, Joe, have joked about this before. I said, you know what we should do is start a Stacking Benjamins hedge fund. And here are the rules. Build, um, build our own SPAC. Ooh. I like it. But um, we're going to start a Stacking Benjamins hedge fund. But here's the behind the scenes. First of all, we're charging you like a hedge fund. It's two and 20, baby. We get 2% of the assets and 20% of the profit. Just is what it is. If you want in, you want in. If you don't, that's okay too. And you have a 15-year lockup on your money. So you can't touch it. You can't withdraw it for 15 years. But I bet you'll have really good returns. And here's what we're going to do with it. When we start the Stacking Benjamins hedge fund, we're just going to put all of your money into U.S. small company value, (laughs) because historically that has the highest return. The thing that I have that the consumer won't have is 15-year time horizon. So we're going to take our 2 and 20 every year, 2% of the value and 20% of all the profits. And at the end of the 15th year, we'll give you all your money back. And you'll still average over 10%. And what's great about that is that you'll actually have more money, even having paid that 2 and 20, because you just let it sit there. And it went up 10, 11, 12% over that period of time, which is going to be better than you trying to day trade your way to success. So you're still, win-win. you're still winning. We're still winning. Yeah. Filthy rich. We're like <laughs> one of those people that you talk about on TV. So it's a little bit, it's that's a little where, bit of protecting, protecting you from yourself. You know, it's like, right. You know, that's where the real money is. Kevin, right there. Start that fund. We gave that to you for free. Start your own little hedge fund. Yeah. Charge your buddies two and 20. Thanks for the question. It's great. I think systems are always the answer and that's the case here. And also always the case. It ain't about the market. It's about you. Uh, head to uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you've got a question for us for being brave and asking that question, we're going to throw a uh, t-shirt code Kevin's way. Greatest money show on earth. One of my favorite Stacky Benjamin shirts. You're wearing the fight night shirt tonight. I am. Yep. Good stuff. And check this out. I've got the mug that has our old school Stacking Benjamins logo on it. Hey, big thanks to everybody for spending uh, today with us. Uh, I know your time's valuable and we appreciate it. It was super fun talking to Olivia today. Uh, Big thanks to her, of course. Uh, Doug's going to thank her in just a second. A couple things I always forget to talk about. Number one is... You can listen to us on your smart speaker. Just if you've got a smart speaker in the room, just say, Alexa, play Stacking Benjamins and continue monitoring all my conversations. Or maybe just say, listen to, listen. Is is that, would that be too far? It's not false. Play Stacking Benjamins. And then second, we also have a preview guide For members of the Stacker, uh, our newsletter, not only will you get lessons that I've learned on my own financial journey, but you will also get a preview of Monday and Wednesday shows with some extras thrown in. So if you'd like to follow along or get a preview the evening before, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Stacker. And last, if you're somebody that needs more than a preview of a podcast, you really need serious financial help in your corner. And you're not, as we talk about all the time, surrounding yourself with great people. OG and his team are taking clients. So if you want to add a great team to your team to do better with your money, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. That's their calendar where you can then talk to them about how they can interface with you so you make better money decisions. 
Last, thanks to, I said that was last. I got one more here. Thanks to people who have left us a review of this show. Uh, Mixie Jame, I know I'm getting this wrong. Mixie Jame one, five stars. Love being a stacker. Stacky Benjamins is a happy place for learning about finance and personal growth. I always look forward to Monday, Wednesday, Friday releases and enjoy being part of the basement, our Facebook group, stackybedjamins.com forward slash basement is the quick way to get there, by the way. I've learned so many things that I put into practice that have helped improve my family's financial well-being. I'm so thankful for that. SB is a great cast, interesting guest, and is an all-around wonderful podcast. Been a listener for close to two years now, and I hope to be part of it for many, many more. Love it. Now, on a serious note, Joe and OG, you know why we're all here. I'm also here for Doug. More Doug, please. See ya. <laughs> well, you're about to get uh, more Doug right now, Mixie Jame one uh, so Doug, take it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Lots of people talk about becoming a millionaire, but you need to remember inflation. If your goal is to save to become a millionaire in 30 years, is that enough to meet your goals? Second, take a lesson from Olivia Campbell. Want to be a trailblazer? Get a community and say nay to the naysayers. You'll never go anywhere if you follow the court of public opinion. But the big lesson? Joe's mom was playing with me the entire time. She didn't care about the history comment at all. Turns out her Harley needs waxing, and she was just waiting for some way to get me to do it. For free. Again. Hey, I wonder if that wax is where I got this rash from. Maybe. Probably shouldn't have put it there, though. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more about the advances that women have made in the world of medicine, check out Olivia's new book, Women in White Coats, How the First Women Doctors Changed the World of Medicine, wherever books are sold. We'll link to Olivia's local bookstore she referenced in the interview, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Speaking of our show notes, do you know that we make a guide for each Monday and Wednesday episode that goes out the night before? You can get that, plus Joe's discussions of good financial lessons and some poignant stories on how he messed things up for himself if you sign up for the stacker. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker for more. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Hey, all season long, we're going to have, or we have been, we've been featuring people that have uh, had these fun brushes with fame during uh, this after show segment. So if you've got one, send them to me, joe at stackybedjamins.com 
or uh, call the Haven Lifeline like we had last week. We're going to pick someone uh, at random. You know, we'll probably OG pick a few people uh, because this is this is always just a ton of fun. Hearing about all these awkward moments when we might have gotten it uh, not quite right. The deal is, if you're brand new to the show, you hear about these times when somebody takes their picture with one celebrity and asks another celebrity who you didn't even notice to hold the camera and take the picture. <laughs> And right. then you re you realize that you're getting your picture taken with Matthew Broderick and it's Jerry Seinfeld who's taking your picture, uh, things like that. So we've had, we've had some fun ones there, but we're going to take a little break from that today because OG, oh, I actually went and saw a movie in a movie theater. We just, uh, had the Academy award nominations come out and this movie was nominated for not only best picture, but best actor. Let's listen to a little snippet of it. This stars two pretty unknown actors, Anthony Hopkins. Did I say that right? Hopkins mm -hmm. and Olivia Coleman all day today talking about Olivia Campbell, our wonderful guest today. I have to say, I kept wanting to call her Olivia Coleman, but here is uh, a little bit of the father. Date of birth? Friday, 31st of December, 1937. You're living with your daughter at the moment? Yes, until she goes to live in Paris. No, Dad, why do you keep going on about Paris? You told me. No, I didn't. I'm sorry, Anne, you told me the other day. Have you forgotten? She's forgotten. <laughs> Paris. They don't even speak English there. Dad, I'd like you to meet Laura. How oh. do you do, sir? I say, you're gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> I must say, he's charming. Yeah. Not always. Laura has come round to help you. I don't need her or anyone else. I can manage very well on my own. Everything all right? Who are you? Actually, it's me, Paul. Who? I live here. What is this nonsense? Anne? It's me. Ah, there she is. Your father seemed a bit confused. Something wrong? Where's Anne? Sorry? Anne, where is she? I'm here. This is uh, something that is uh, something, uh, OG, you and I have talked about here on the show, which is you are near the end of your life and uh, memory begins to go, right? Start having some cognitive issues. And in this case, maybe, maybe some Alzheimer's. You really don't know what's going on, except the scene continually changes in the movie and you're seeing different things. You're seeing different people. Anthony Hopkins is being cared for by his daughter. Daughter seems increasingly frustrated because she's trying to find him help. I mean, how many of us have firsthand experience mm -hmm. in this area, or at least secondhand experience, have friends that have gone through this with an older loved one? So when I first saw this movie, I thought, you know, Anthony Hopkins, Olivia Coleman, this is a movie that will, because of the subject matter, it's never going to have a big, big audience. So I was super excited to see that it was a, that was nominated for both Academy Award and him for Best Actor because somebody having these cognitive issues that are around us all the time and having it displayed on a screen doesn't sound like a fun two hours at all. And yet, because of the way they did it, because the way it was acted, directed, and frankly, the cinematography where we're seeing life through his eyes. Every time we go in the room, uh, uh, well, you heard him say, where's Anne? And the woman's like, I am Anne. But the problem, OG, is he's looking at this woman and it's not his daughter. It's a different person. And you're like, what the hell's going on? I had no idea what's going on. And then I wonder if I'm in a science fiction movie, like what's really going on? And I can't you can't quite figure it out, but they keep you on the edge of your seat. Every time you, uh, Cheryl had to go to the bathroom partway through and she's like, I don't, I, I don't want to go to the bathroom because I'm going to miss something because every time Anthony Hopkins turns a corner, the room has changed. And you're thinking, is it, you feel like you're watching inception, you know, where the world is turning upside down. You're just, well, what the hell? Sometimes there's art on the wall. Sometimes they're in a different flat. Sometimes they're in a nursing home. Got no idea what the hell is going on until the very end. And even then they leave you with some interesting questions that'll make you talk about it later. So I think for people that are interested in financial planning topics, like 
elder care. It's fantastic, but it's even a great introduction to these topics for people that go, yeah, I don't want to talk about this stuff. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want, it was great. It was, it was truly a great movie. At first I thought it was because I haven't seen a movie in a year in a theater <laughs> and I was just giddy. Yeah. And Cheryl and I were like, is, is, is this just because we've had a long dry spell that I thought this movie was great? And then the very next day after we saw it, the Academy Awards come out and it's up for two. And I went, nope, wasn't wrong. Nope. It is that good. All right. Yeah. But it's two Anthony cool, Hopkins. Two cool actors. Yeah. This dude's 82 years old and bringing it. OG. I mm-hmm. hope I'm bringing it like Anthony Hopkins when I'm 82. It's only a couple decades from now. So I hope so. Ease. I'm I'm right here. Right, right here, man. I got a full work career to go until, you know, they say 30 and out. I got like a good, yeah. I got like a good 50 and out before I get there. 28, 28, t- 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 29, but easy, easy. 29. All right. 